welcome back from your break. Before the break, we had a look at transpiration and the factors that affect transpiration. What we're going to look at in this part of the lesson is how do they ask questions on this particular type of thing? Now, many questions on transpiration start off with experiments or use an experiment as an example. And the problem is this is not necessarily an experiment that you have seen. It's not necessarily an experiment that you know about, but you have to look at it, work out what is happening in the experiment, and then try and link it to, for transpiration, it's either going to be a change in the environmental factors, in other words, your wind, humidity, um, light intensity, temperature, or it might have something to do with a plant and how its leaves are structured to try and lessen the amount of transpiration that occurs. And you guys need to be on the ball so that you can actually pick up what you need to get from each particular experiment that has been um, put down in the question. So we're going to be looking at a couple of these experiments and looking at, well, how do you go about this? How do you think the answers out? And how would you go about answering them? So first one is looking. Oh, I forgot to say, this is also an ideal opportunity for the examiner to test your practical skills. What do I mean by practical skills? It's things like ability to draw a graph, ability to draw a conclusion, knowing what a hypothesis is, knowing what dependent and independent variables are. So they're often tied in with these experiments on transpiration. So let's have a look at this first example. So it's two plants how much water they've lost, and key. One plant had small leaves with a thick cuticle and hairy epidermis. And this tells you straight away that this plant is going to undergo less transpiration. The other plant had large leaves with a thin cuticle. So what they're testing here is how different plants are adapted to lessen the amount of transpiration. Now, the experiment was done, and the change in mass of each twig was measured. In other words, they didn't use a pitometer. They just put the twig in um, the sun, and then they looked to see how much water it had lost, and they measured that by seeing how much weight it had lost. Okay, and they then worked out the percentage loss of mass. And they then put it in a table. And you have to be able to interpret tables like this. So, when you get a table, you have to try and work out what is this table actually telling me. So let's have a look at this table and work out what information can we gain from this table. Okay, first of all, one plant is losing a lot of water. One plant is not losing so much water. What does this tell us straight away before we've even looked at the questions? Which is the plant with large leaves? and a thin cuticle. It's obviously got to be the plant that is losing the most amount of water. So before you even start looking at the questions, look and see what is the table telling you. So the table is telling you that of these two plants, one is losing water very quickly, and the other one, in the same amount of time, is losing about half the amount of water. Now, let's look at the questions. A typical question like this, after, help, after expecting you to be able to interpret what is going on in the table, it asks you to draw 
line graphs. Now, I know many of you don't really like drawing graphs. You don't have to be an expert graph drawer because quite honestly, half, sometimes more than half the marks allocated to a graph are given for putting in a heading and labeling your axes and putting units on your axes. So that even if you draw, if you plot your points and the point, points aren't perfectly correct, you're not going to get naught for the graph. You're just going to be losing some marks. And in this case, because it's two line graphs, you're often also given a mark for either putting a key and using different symbols for each line or simply on your graph labeling each line as plant number one or plant number two. So don't be scared of graph questions. If you know what you're doing, they're actually an easy way to get marks. Okay, next question. Explain why the greatest loss of mass occurred between 12 and 2. Now, this is linking the experiment to what you've learned about the factors which increase transpiration. And we know there are four factors which increase transpiration. The question says, why is transpiration the greatest between 12 and 2? And you should be able to work out 12 and 2, midday, sun is bright, so it would be high light intensity, and midday is hottest, so it would also be highest temperature. Then, the third one requires you to think. If you lived in a dry area, which of the plants would you plant? And why? And that's, this is where you use your common sense. You've seen the table which says the one plant loses so much water and you'd have to keep watering it if it was in your garden. The other plant you wouldn't have to water every day. So to make sense and to save water, which is the plant that you would plant if you lived in a dry area? That would be plant number one. Next question, and sometimes the description of the experiments are actually quite long. Don't let that fool you. Use a highlighter and pick up the important points. The length is simply to explain to you exactly what is happening in this experiment. Don't get bogged down in it. Highlight what is important. Okay, so we have two different species, A and B, and then they're using something called a wind tunnel. And the wind tunnel blows air at different speeds. And then they measure the amount of transpiration occurring. And this is where they would then use a pitometer to measure how fast transpiration is occurring. One of the questions that could be asked, what is the most suitable piece of apparatus to use in a wind tunnel to actually measure the amount of transpiration? And you could then say a pitometer. Okay, the rest of it is just explaining what happens. First, they had a wind of five meters per second. The rate was measured four times, then there was 10, then there was 15, and then there was 20. And your first measurement is in still air, so you've got one, two, three, four, five readings. And then those readings were used to draw up a graph. So let's try and interpret what is this graph actually telling us? Okay, it shows time, and on that axis, it also shows the transpiration rate, and here it shows the hours. And as you can see, these changes correspond to the different wind speeds that 
the plant was placed under. And as we can see, as the wind speed increases, what happens to your rate of transpiration? Increases. Oops, but does it occur? The same in both plants. Remember, here we've got species A and species B. And species B is here at the bottom. So what can you tell straight away about species B? It's tough. It has something that means it doesn't transpire too much, whereas species A, whoops, that's going to die in the wind. Now, what questions could be asked? You could be asked to interpret, read off the graph, and here it says during which hour did species A have the highest transpiration rate, and that would be this point, which is here, between hours three and four. <clears throat> then the next one is explain why four readings are taken, and this is a practical skill. The more readings you take, the more accurate your results are. And number 2.3, three external factors, and that takes us to our humidity, light, and temperature. And here we have some more description, relationship between wind speed and transpiration, and that is directly from the graph. So you would talk about what is happening here on the graph. Then 2.5 is explain how the wind influences transpiration. And here you would talk about the wind blowing the moisture away. 2.6 you would have to explain what is happening inside the leaf with the water evaporating and moving out through the stomata. And then 2.7, which would not survive in a windy habitat, and that's obviously number A. And then the last question is an application question. Explain the benefits of using a greenhouse while growing plant, and that obviously is because in a greenhouse there isn't any wind. I hope that has helped you a little bit so you won't, when you look at questions like this, get a fright and wonder what to do. Thank you. <laughs>